This is the Open University. This is the doldrums of summer, uh, which is kind of a, a not stressful enough time. It's a time of too much relaxation, and uh, that in itself is a stress, to be paradoxical. But uh, I wanted to go without a theme today, really, except to, to look at some pictures in my current folder, just things I've uh, sort of collected in July as a way to think about what I'm preoccupied by. Um, quite incidental and random things, like uh, exhibitions which are on here in Berlin, cafes I've been going to, conversations I've been overhearing. Um, so without further ado, let's launch into it. So the first thing that sort of caught my eye in my clippings file this month was uh, something in Jutaku Tokushu, which is uh, the architectural magazine New, new house construction, literally, uh, that I sort of subscribe to. I think it's the last magazine I subscribe to, the last monthly, that really sort of excites me. And um, mainly just for the photography. But, I, but if an article looks interesting, I, I sort of hold up my um, Google Translate camera on my phone and I see what the Japanese is actually saying. So this was a case of that. Um, Chimpom, who... Uh, were about 10 years ago, they were a sort of young, controversial art group, art and performance group who um, made a big splash in Japan, um, partly uh, by offending people uh, in Hiroshima because they, uh, on the anniversary of the atomic um, bomb dropping on Hiroshima, which I think is August the 5th, uh, so it's pretty much now. Got a sky writing plane to, to write the words pika pika in the sky. Uh, and pika pika means like a flash. Perhaps it was just one pika, but it's the word for a flash such as an atomic bomb would make in the sky. And this caused a lot of people with actual traumatic memories complained. It's the ultimate trigger, isn't it, really, if you've lived through a, a nuclear assault on your city. Uh, one of the great crimes of history, I have to say. But um, the opinion was obviously divided on whether they should have triggered those people with that word in that manner. Uh, they've matured <laughs> over the next decade. And um, now Chimpom uh, have renovated a house in just the area where Shinjuku meets um, Shinokubo. Um, but in the late 50s and early 60s, Arata Isozaki had this uh, house. He built a house. He designed a house and built it uh, in Shinjuku. It was called the Shinjuku White House. And this was the site of some performances uh, which were part of the Japanese Neo Dada movement. A lot of um, happenings and performances and um, a belated explosion of Dada irreverence and fun and craziness in Japan. So um, Chimpom have found this house and renovated it. So I think they plan to, to have exhibitions and performances. It was previously being used as their studio, uh, but now they've opened it up a bit more and they've, they, they spent about three, four months this year renovating it. Not a huge renovation. Um, it's mostly covered in cascading kutsu, I think it's called, which is like the Japanese ivy. And um, Oh, yeah, this is the cover of that issue, and this is the cover house, which reminds me, this form of um, kind of concrete umbrellas, sunshades made of concrete, is something I saw a lot in Greece. It's actually a very specific um, part of Greek architecture in the 60s, and I saw, I photographed a lot of uh, examples of this in um, Glyfada, for instance. Let's move on to another thing I saw this month, which is uh, an exhibition at uh, the Kunstraum Kreuzberg uh, here in Berlin. And it's um, called Wild Frictions, the Politics and Poetics of Interruption. And I'm going to just read from this uh, uh, blurb. 
Wild Frictions, the politics and poetics of interruption, explores minor disruptions, surprising and unforeseen interventions, delays and repetitions. So on their website, there are disruptions on the actual website, little bits of color, sort of confetti start appearing on the screen and uh, making it impossible to read. So they've, um, they walk it like they talk it. Delays and repetitions and their potential to show alternative ways of existing and behaving. Very important theme, actually. I think uh, in a time when the art world is in danger of embracing the same wooden tongue that officialdom embraces, you know, I think it's very important to um, to disrupt and to interrupt. And th this, I guess, is going back to situationism a bit. Um, or just the idea of being a flaneur also, the idea of um, that a successful flaneur's walk through a city would involve a lot of surprises and interruptions and kind of um, des choses imprévues, uh, things which you did not predict. But then when you curate that and put it in an exhibition, maybe there's something slightly paradoxical about that because you're trying to plan for the unplanned or you're trying to um, corral the accidental or make the accidental look purposive. Or, there are all sorts of interesting paradoxes. So it says here, rather than looking to heroic, eloquent figures or stimulating united and collective moments, uh, this exhibition locates emancipation in subtle idiosyncratic forms of mischief making in the playful slippages or in the spaces in between sounds and syllables. This makes me think of um, Michel de Certeau and uh, the, the, the distinction between the strategic and the tactical. A strategic tends to be an official bureaucratic thing, a bit like a museum, you could say. And the tactical is uh, what people do when they, you know, do slightly naughty things in museums or stick a little bit of blue tack up and make it look like it might potentially be part of the exhibition or might not. You know, lots of things artists have done to subvert, sometimes with the imprimatur and the blessing of the institution, as when I did my unreliable tour guide thing, it, it was a bit like Kafka's story, Panthers in the Temple, a very, very short little parable where Kafka says that Panthers broke into the temple and drank the sacrificial wine. And they did this with such regularity that eventually it was integrated into the ceremony. So this is what's happened with various um, disruptive um, forces in the art world where people come up with uh, things like um, uh, what's called... Uh, institutional critique and then later it was called relational aesthetics and you know each successive wave of curators and museum directors understands that you need to bring in a little unpredictability and that it's uh, something they can co-opt in a way so i was very much part of a co-opted um, institutional critique which the institution had taken on board the institution in the art world is always guilty and especially now when people are kind of standing outside with placards or virtually standing on Twitter with placards saying, you know, Tate founded its fortune on uh, slavery, blah, blah, blah. So the institution, or Whitney in the US, whatever, it's always about money laundering and and trying to, uh, you know, greenwash or, or <laughs> identity wash its, um, its project to, to make up for... Uh, this guilt, this inherent guilt, which is not a bad thing. You know, I think guilt is, is in many ways good. Uh, it's simply the internalization of the needs and concerns of other people. But of course, it can be, <laughs> it can be obvious that the institution itself would not want to, uh, to be doing this unless it was being forced. Its nose was being rubbed into its uh, crimes or the crimes of a colonial past which it's connected to. So it says here, the subversive artistic approaches, actions and acts simultaneously evoke feelings of alienation and loss of control, which in turn reflect anxieties and tensions associated with the pandemic. So it's got a relevance to the COVID pandemic and social uprisings of the past and this year. Uh, the personal gridlock, the numerous protests, repeated quarantines, as well as economic and social pauses. Then they quote Heiner Muller who made his own takes in the 80s on Shakespeare, on Hamlet in particular, wanted the gap in the flow, the other in the return of the same, stuttering in speechless text, the whole in the ever perhaps redeeming error. I was sitting at my favourite cafe, my new favourite cafe, which is uh, in Neukölln, it's called Bully's Bakery, um, recently reading, re-reading um, uh, Christian Enzensberger's fantastic uh, book, which Calder and Boyer has put out in the 70s, I think called um, Smut and Anatomy of Dirt, which was a big influence on my Hippopotamomus record, the, the idea of crossing the line, dividing clean from dirty. And um, it's like a commonplace book, the way Ensensberger has compiled it. He's compiled a lot of 
writings from other people that are on the theme and uh, and then poetic kind of ramblings in which he thinks about what is dirty, what makes something dirty, what makes something clean, is it desirable to get dirty sometimes. So there is a there's some kind of um overlap between the idea of the the disruption, the surprise, the idea of um, habit, as Beckett said, being a great deadener. Habit is a great deadener. Uh, and so sometimes dirt or unpredictability are ways to get out of the boredom. I mean, I'm in the doldrums of summer. I'm a bit bored, you know, admittedly. And, and we've all been locked down in various ways or quarantined or um, simply restricted in ways that we're not used to during this pandemic, the right to be unpredictable and changeable and volatile in and of itself being useful. So that was, I mean, actually the text was um, more interesting really than the exhibition itself. The main thing I liked in that was Lily Renaud Dewa. And she's actually a character in one of my books. She dances naked in the style, almost blacked up. I mean, she's using body paint, sometimes silver. It was mostly silver body paint in this video, um, but she was dancing around all the venues in Okayama of the uh, the regular Okayama Biennial. Another weird connection with my Hippopotamus album, actually, um, is that she was, uh, she dances like uh, Josephine Baker, who's mentioned in um, one of the songs on Hippopotamus, uh, the Michelin Man song, actually, which got taken off the album. Uh, Josephine Baker, make him Zeppelin hard with your bicycle pump. And he'll bump you till your bed's just junk. So uh, she's, she's not quite blacked up, but she is sort of doing a cultural appropriation thing and she's doing a nakedness thing. And it's, it's quite naughty in many ways. In terms of the current dogmas, it's a little bit naughty and a little bit against the... <laughs> it's a discordant note in the hymn. Okay, I'm going back to my folder to see what else I've been thinking about. Um... Oh yeah, here's a weird thing, a slide from a presentation. I, I can't remember how I found this presentation. Uh, it's like a, a Zoom meeting, uh, and it's a program run by the British Museum. The program basics are, uh, well, the, 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 head, the headlines are, what is pornography? And then dash, Japan, ancient Egypt, and ancient Greece. Uh, next uh, bullet point, exploring consent, 16th century Benin, medieval Sri Lanka, ancient Rome. And then, which remi reminds me, <laughs> I was just in an English language bookshop here in Berlin looking at Margaret Mead's um, Coming of Age in Samoa, uh, which was a, you know, a big um, bestseller in that anthropology uh, in the 60s, but now is probably looked at, uh, I mean, I would have to research how it's seen now, but it's probably seen as very... Um, very off message. Um, next one, body image across time, ancient Greece, medieval Sri Lanka, uh, LGBTQIA+, plus, <laughs> ancient Rome, old Babylonia, epi Paleolithic, Natufians from the Levant, and then gender and identity, old Babylonia, contemporary Zimbabwe, medieval Tamil Nadu. Now, what does that suggest to you? Look on the left-hand side, in bold, we've got... Um, the hymn sheet, essentially, exploring consent, body image, um, uh, identity politics, gender and identity. I mean, the, the usual stuff that we, we see from all in guilty institutions trying to show that they're on the right uh, side of history. They're not offside. They're not being caught offside. <laughs> uh, and then on the right, you get this wonderful collection of other cultures, which are, you know, exemplary uh, as ways to escape from the hymn sheet, as ways to, to look at totally different uh, contextualizations of things like the body, or this wonderful repository of different ways of thinking and seeing. That could be an amazing source of um, all those things that the Berlin exhibition was talking about, disruption, um, surprising and unforeseen interventions, delays and repetitions. And um, what Beckett was talking about, habit is a great deadener. It's a great deadener of the mind as well. And um, I think our habit now is to always look for a weaponized victimhood in whatever we look at. And uh, this is a, a great way to escape from that if they're using it as an escape. Or maybe what they're doing is they're, they're doing the opposite. They're herding all that fantastic strangeness, weirdness, which I'm always trying to investigate by listening to documentaries about what did music really sound like in ancient Greece? Well, actually, it, it wasn't even what we call music, you know. It was, 
it was so different that it's it's herding people uh, away from all that strangeness towards uh, this very encadré, very kind of boxed way that we have now of thinking. And it reminds me a bit of a review of an exhibition about Joshua Reynolds in London where the reviewers on TV, I think it was the late review, they were saying, well, of course, uh, Joshua Reynolds was the herald of today's cult of celebrity and the, the iconic, you know. <laughs> the iconic was the shibboleth of the time. And I was so sick of that word, the iconic. I never wanted to hear the word iconic again. Iconic, iconic, iconic. <laughs> you heard it. That was all people could say. And it instantly summed up these ideas of sort of Andy Warhol's Mao or Marilyn or whatever, that things were like, once, once things became so famous that you recognized them without even thinking about them, in other words, there was recognition without cognition, uh, they became iconic. And, and that was a way to put them out of bounds, to stop thinking about things. I think this is my objection to the um, the kind of guilt of the institutions that I'm talking about as well. It's not a way to think about anything at all. It's a way to stop thinking about things and simply to say, we're on the right side of history. Here's um, the main story on the BBC News website being about Kentaro Kobayashi's gaff. He's the guy who designed the creative in charge of the uh, Olympics opening ceremony. And... Uh, sacked two days before the ceremony because he'd made in the late 90s, like I think in 1998, a, a joke about the Holocaust. What really struck me, okay, it struck me, first of all, that he's, he looks pretty elegant. Um, he's the most elegant person to have the lead story on the BBC News site in July. And um, it happened just a few days after the Cornelius episode, which I don't really want to go into. I mean, I, I have potentially so much to say about that but really because he's a, an associate uh, or has been in the past uh, I don't think I should go there but it, but it, it just seemed like although his um, his boss I guess uh, Kentaro Kobayashi's gaff was so much smaller and less serious what really struck me was that okay he's he's elegant in a kind of Sakamoto-esque way with those little round glasses but also it was impossible to read what he had actually said about the holocaust and um, so I, I spent, I went down the rabbit hole of researching what he'd actually said. And I found the sketch. He was a member in the 90s. I guess it's still going, actually. I remember of this comedy duo called Ramans. Um, and it's Jin Katagiri and Kentaro Kobayashi. So um, they met at to the Tama Art Academy. I think they were doing printmaking or something at Tama Art Academy. So they're kind of creative types and they're, their um, comedy style was pretty surreal, almost neo-dada, if you like. And it was a parody of um, a children's educational show called Do You Think You Can Do It? Um, so Kobayashi is um, dressed up as Nopo-san, who is the presenter, in, in a funny kind of uh, floppy hat. And, uh, and so they're talking about, let's make a, a baseball bat made of paper, and then let's make a whole stand made of paper, and um, then let's people the stand with paper, cut out paper humans. Go over there, um, Gonta, and uh, you'll find a, a heap of them because you were playing, uh, playing the Holocaust, remember? And um, okay, so it's a, it's a pretty bad taste joke, but it's a very surreal, Dadaistic uh, image. And it reminds people of the Holocaust, just as um, uh, Jim Palm reminded people of the atomic bombings, which is something the Japanese don't want to forget, just as the Jewish people don't want to forget the, the Holocaust. These are things, you know, art and even comedy do uh, speak unspeakable things sometimes or, or speak things which want to, ought to be remembered sometimes. Um, and I think one of the problems is the transition between marginality and centrality. It rem reminds me a bit of um, what happened in the London Olympics in 2012, when you had Danny Boyle, this film director, always a creative person who's sort of proved himself somewhat on the margins and, and, and then had a commercial success, uh, brought in to give, you know, a feeling of, I mean, uh, United by Emotion was the title of the uh, Tokyo 20. 
20 Olympics opening ceremony, which of course happened in 2021. It did go ahead pretty much as um, Kobayashi had planned it because they couldn't really come up with anything new in, time, in, in two days. But um, and apparently it was quite successful. Danny Boyle was desperate, of course, to get David Bowie involved in uh, 2012. Bowie, and even apparently flew out to New York to meet with Bowie to discuss him coming in person to sing Heroes at the ceremony. They did end up, I think, using Heroes, uh, a, a recording of Heroes, but Bowie uh, absolutely point blank refused. Very wisely, I think, because the thing is that once you... Um, the creative people are always going to be doing dangerous things somewhat on the margins, the interesting ones anyway. And uh, once you start roping those people into uh, at central positions where they have to represent the state and the authority of the state and the power of the state and the dignity and... And there is always an element of this, you know, if, as soon as an artist becomes more successful and more mainstream, they open themselves to uh, the danger of, of, of things that they never thought would be heard, they never thought would resonate, um, start to resonate in all these, all the wrong places, uh, you know, and uh, so many people must feel that there are little um, depth charges, little landmines uh, in their past, which could explode if they go too central. Suddenly the room is, it's simultaneously much bigger, but it's also much smaller in the sense that whatever you say or have said in the past can be overheard by people you never dreamed would, would be judging you. The misfortune of success, in a way, is that you, you go into a place where you're almost literally thinking all the time, did I just say that aloud? Because <laughs> you can no longer, the more uh, authority you have vested in you and the more centrality your position in society, the less you can actually say. The Olympics as a cultural event is incredibly boring. Um, and I suppose, in, but in some way, because I hate the Olympics, I was quite happy that these scandals happened, that they, didn't, they tried to get some artists in uh, and, and, and get the kudos and the excitement and the edginess of what art can provide. But they didn't seem to realize that art is a constantly exploding bomb and artists are drawn, the good ones, are drawn to the unsayable, the naughty, the unpredictable. And so we come back full circle to the theme of that exhibition in Kreuzberg that, um, you know, you do have to disrupt. You can't really call yourself an artist if you've never disrupted anything. If you just kind of trot out the official bien pensant, you know, line on things, that is not any kind of art. And why should you just, you know, why should you be co-opted or allow yourself to be co-opted by such an incredibly boring uh, mainstream? It's rigid with um, unoriginality. Those are my thoughts this August. Open University. 